All right, everyone, this lecture is about archaeology in the Great Lakes, uh, beaches, landscapes, giant beasts, and projectile points. And I should note that this uh, lecture was first written by Dr. Or was written by Dr. Jan Brashler, a uh, retired archaeologist from Grand Valley State University, um, and then I am now stealing it from her. Uh -huh. Anyway, it's a little bit about the background, right? Of course, lakes formed prior to the Pleistocene. Uh, with, you know, the uh, previous advances of the, uh, the ice sheets, but uh, they were modified repeatedly during the last glacial advance, which, of course, was the Wisconsin uh, ice advance stage, right? Uh, also, it's important to remember that people like to live by water, so where people lived has a lot to do with these paleo or old shorelines and where those are, right? We need to have, therefore, a basic understanding of the timing of these different uh, lake stages uh, in order to help us figure out who was where when, right? Uh, and where different beaches, dunes, systems like that are all located during these various lake stages, right? So human uh, arrive in the Great Lakes at the end of the uh, uh, the sequence here when the ice last retreats after the, uh, you know, during the recession of the Wisconsin glaciers. Um, and uh, conventional wisdom is around 11,200 years ago. There might be some evidence as early as 12,500 years ago down by in Illinois. Um, but either way, we're talking late quaternary, uh, late Pleistocene indeed, right? And of course, our glaciers had huge influence on the climate, which of course greatly influ influences the vegetation, which greatly influences, you know, the critters that are living around there. So as these glaciers retreat, land opens up and eventually becomes colonized by plants and then animals, but that takes some time, right? Some important stages in these lake levels, right? First of all, there are numerous ones of them. We discussed some of them last time. You'll see those names again here. Uh, the most important ones, the Lake, lake Algonquin stage, uh, 13,000 to about 11,800 years ago. Uh, and that was a, a, a fairly high stage, right? The Lake Chippewa slash Stanley stage, or the Lake Chippewa stage, this is the low stand of the lakes, about 11,800, about 8,000 years ago. Uh, the lowest of this was around uh, 9,000 years before present. Uh, this was the Chippewa low stand at 220 feet, right? So see, now this one was at 580, 220 feet. We're talking more than 300 feet of, uh, of lake level drop, right? Why was this? Again, this is according... To um, to you know glacial theory, the um, the uh, the um, ice sheet opened up right and it melted back far enough that it opened up the uh, the channels into the St. Lawrence Seaway and, and Lake Champlain and uh, Champlain Sea and all that. Um, uh, and at that time, the lakes drained possibly catastrophically. Right, um, so opening of channels, uh, closing of other channels in the south. Right, so before this point. Lakes were not really draining out to the Atlantic Ocean. They were draining to the south and to the east uh, into the Midwest. Right? Lake Superior shoreline was exposed as well during these points. Right? And then we have the Lake Nipissing. This is a high stand, uh, high again as the Lake Algonquin stage, as you see here. Right? So the lakes were way down. They went way back up. This was due to isostatic rebound and a shutting off of one of those northern channels. And then we have Lake Algoma around, you know, 3,200 years before present that started. That's at 181 meters, which is about the same that we have today. Our monitor is 181.4 with those variations that we discussed previously. Right? And to show you these pictures again, right, 14,000 years ago, the very earliest of our, our lakes up here, you know, 14,500 years ago, there were no lakes. Uh, here we are at 9,000 years ago. We are in that Lake Algonquin stage, a high stage, you know, similar to kind of what we have today, but a little higher. Um, and then we opened up this northern passage, right? And that allowed the lakes to drain catastrophically. See, here's the, the modern shoreline, and you see where the, uh, the paleo shoreline would have been there 7,000 years ago. So, again, if you're looking for, you know, Native American settlements from that time period, you know, you're going to want to look in what is now the middle of our Great Lakes, right? Uh, and then 4,000 years ago, we had a Lake Nipissing, a high stage, which was even a little bit higher than the stage we have today. 
Uh, and so you would want to look even a little bit more farther inland for those shoreline settlements. Right? So tracing where these paleo shorelines are is very important to uh, interpreting the timing and location of where these, these, um, these uh, uh, Native American settlements may have been. Right? So again, what factors affect the lake levels? We've talked about this before, but hinge lines, right? So we have a hinge line down here in southern Michigan. It's where we're not really rebounding much anymore. The northern area is still rebounding uh, because ice left there later. All right. This leads to isostatic deformation and the, you know, rising and and uh, and shutting off of certain um, uh, uh, water uh, pathways. Right. Climate change. Obviously, as these glaciers are retreating, the climate is changing drastically in the areas south of the glacier. Right? Uh, outlets to the south and east. Those were early on. Right. Later, we developed our current, you know, flowing out to, um, or I'm sorry, south and, and uh, yes, opening to the south and then currently towards the east, right? So we switched from that, that south out to the Midwest and over to a, you know, an easterly modern kind of flow uh, in the, let's see here, right? somewhere around 9,000 years ago we started, right? But then before that, everything was to the south, right? And then at the Lake Chippewa stage, that's when we started kind of our modern uh, drainage system out to the uh, out to the Atlantic Ocean. Nipissing stage, we reactivated that Illinois River outlet, uh, but currently that is no longer um, active. Right, it's an inlet now. Right. So, and then uh, another thing is the importance of geoarchaeology and the application of geology to archaeological studies. Right, and this is very important because, you know, especially when you have these fluctuating lake levels, you're going to need to know your geology in order to know where you are in relation to those lakes and those shorelines and all of that good stuff, right? I showed you this uh, image before, right? This is a going back, uh, you know, to 5,000 years before present um, and looking at those different stages. So here's that Nipissing High stage, as we see, right? And then we are currently down, you know, more right around here, right? But we do see that fluctuation, right? We see not only these, you know, 30 year fluctuations, but superimposed on those are these 160 year fluctuation cycles, right? And as evidence of this, we see former beach ridges. These are evidence of former lake levels. And this is due to two things. First, higher and lower lakes, but also the fact that the land is slowly rising around these lakes creating a series after series of these beach ridges, right? So the physical landscape, you know, during this time, the glaciers would have been, you know, the major kind of force affecting the physical landscape. Uh, between 18,000, which was the peak of the last glaciation, about 11,000 um, BP before present, right? Uh, these uh, glaciers scrape down basically to bedrock, uh, where we have igneous and metamorphic up in the Upper Peninsula, right, and some sandstones up there as well. But mostly our our um, our sandstones, our shales, our carbonates, and our evaporites, which are all Paleozoic sediments, are here in well the the southern half of the UP and uh, the Lower Peninsula as well. Right, this bedrock was then covered by the crap that the glaciers scraped up that glacial till some areas there's none of it but most areas you know it's you know fairly deep it can get up to 350 meters deep uh in some areas so that is a lot of smashed up messed up rock right? so it's obviously that the glaciers play major roles in the development of of landforms and surface landforms and we talked about some of these before right glacial moraines that that stuff that's kicked out in front of the glacier kind of like a conveyor belt Till plains, which are behind, is what the glacier was running over. Drumlins, tunnel valleys, right? These are lakes, cames and eskers, outwash plains. That's what's in front of the ice as it's melting. Right? Beach ridges uh, along the lakes and the paleo shorelines. And lake plain sediments where the lakes formerly were um, that were uh, being formed at that time. Right? So let's talk a little bit again about some of the Pleistocene flora and fauna that is found 
uh, around the Great Lakes. First of all, plant remains. We don't have too many actual, you know, hard plant remains, but uh, most of it is, uh, uh, you know, reconstructed through um, a pollen and, and some macro fossil remains, twigs, seeds, maybe some leaves if you're lucky, right? Um, these are generally covered from lake and bog sediments, which leads to preservation because those are anoxic. Uh, they lack oxygen, which means that microbes don't get to them and uh, destroy that, right? Uh, there are some sampling issues. Some plants are just, you know, more prolific and their, you know, pollen and everything may, uh, may kind of overtake a sequence, right? Uh, and then we also have macrofossils. That can be used for radio for carbon dating, right? You find a big chunk of wood, you can use that for radiocarbon dating. And then these create these nice pollen diagrams which show the percent of which kinds of pollen you have, the depth that they were recovered, uh, and then the age in, in calibrated radiocarbon years before present. That's just a calibration curve that's put on uh, carbon dating, right? So what we get from this is we see a march of these different types of vegetation, these different types of, of environments, north as the ice retreats, right? So that makes sense. Ice is covering an area, obviously there's no vegetation there. As the ice melts back further and further, you know, first you're gonna have a whole lot of outwash, which is kind of dampen um, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, or hem hinder the plants basically. Um, and then, you know, eventually you'll start to form, you know, plants will start to take over and then the the critters that are associated with that that landscape will will come in as well so if we look from like 17,000 down to present here we can see that we have a southern peninsula lower peninsula and then kind of our upper peninsulas we'll notice that from the south of course the ice left south first so we would expect these different uh, ecosystems to develop south you know in the south first and then move north as they are able to as that ice retreats and that's exactly what we see here right tundra 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 as that retreats spruce pack spruce pack spruce pack right pine 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 so we notice that as these uh glaciers retreat again the uh vegetation changes uh in response to these these glaciers moving further north and the environment changing as a response to that following the vegetation of course come the critters right so uh, you can't have critters in an area living there until the ecosystem is established, until the, the plant, the fauna that they live on and thrive on is, is there, right? Uh, Pleistocene fauna in the Great Lakes, mostly fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, most notably, our mastodonts and our mammoths, right? Uh, and here is a, a little image showing what's called the mason Quimby line. Not to be confused with the Mason-Dixon line, totally different thing. The Mason-Quimby line here is a line that past this line, farther north of this line, no mastodon or mammoth remains have been recovered. Why is that? Well, it's because of this march, this progression of the, the, of the flora north, right? So up here, the ice maybe had retreated, but the vegetation that the mammoths and mastodons uh, required to live on had not established in this region yet, right? So by the time the mammoths and the mastodons became extinct, this was as far north as their their habitat allowed, right? Now, of course, if they had survived longer, then we would find them up further north. Right? So let's look at some of these cool Pleistocene critters. Once again, I know I showed you some of them before. Here are our mammoths, right? You notice how big these guys were, right? Larger than a modern elephant. We have a longhorned bison. That's fairly scary. Imagine that guy coming at you, right? The short-faced bear or cave bear, much larger than even our grizzly bears or Kodiak bears today, right? These would have been uh, roaming around North America as well. Uh, sabers, gotta love sabers. Saber tooth cat, this guy, Smilodon, probably Smilodon californicus. I don't think they found any of these around here but they were a Pleistocene age critters, right? And then lots of peccaries and horses and camels. These are all Pleistocene megafauna of the, the United States and of North America, um, including horses, which we don't think of as native to North America, but they were until they went extinct in these Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions, right? Uh, the Yukon horse as well, right? And these aren't around here, these are farther south. Uh, but the giant ground sloth, 
All right, look at the size of this thing. That is a sloth that would take you out. All right. <laughs> Grazers and browsers, mammoths and mastodonts, right? We have two different types and they lived in two different environments. Our mammoths, we can tell this by their teeth. Mammoth teeth are much different than mastodon teeth. Mammoth teeth are meant for grinding things such as grass. So they lived out in, in the plains. Whereas mastodonts, their teeth more show them as foraging for, you know, leaves and stuff off trees. So they are more of a forest dwelling critter. Right? And then, of course, everyone's favorite, the giant beaver, right? The beaver that, you know, here's a, an image of what the giant beaver would look like compared to the beaver now. Uh, up to 450 pounds, 8.25 feet long. That is one big rodent. Right? Now, how did this Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions happen? I should have noted that it didn't happen just here in North America. They happened in Europe as well to these Pleistocene megafaunas. Right? Um, so there's a few different hypotheses. There's the overkill hypothesis. Humans hunted these things to death. Uh, there is a pretty high correlation between people show up and when large things go extinct. Uh, disease could be another one, uh, or even possibly environmental uh, change, but these guys did survive quite a bit of environmental change as well. Right? Either way, here's our Pleistocene megafauna, uh, you know, just kind of hanging out in the grasslands there, all for you to see. The before and the after right, of the megafaunal extinctions. Horses did survive in Europe, right, goats as well, uh, antelopes, right. But most big things, right, mammoths, mastodons, some of our giant bison, these giant moose, right, or elk, they all went extinct, right. And again, the question is, you know, to what extent did humans hunt or rely on these beasts? And there is some evidence uh, of hunting and, and uh, butchering of these animals, but not as much as you would expect if humans are the sole cause, right? So what was the, the real role of human in extinction, right? Some of our notable losses, giant beaver, stags or the Scots moose, the peccary, mammoths, and mastodons, we all have to say goodbye to, unfortunately, right? Uh, in the next video, we'll discuss chronology of the Native American uh, units in the Great Lakes region.